So I come to you today once again from the beautiful timberlands of Oaxaca, Mexico. And actually they remind me a lot of the forests of the northeastern United States. There's a lot of pine and it's actually fairly cold. The biggest difference is that it's a lot steeper and instead of moose there are jaguars. Which I kind of want to and don't want to see at the same time depending on the situation. But regardless, I want to talk to you today about one major advantage that you have as a landowner. Now in my last video I talked a lot about the microeconomic forces of land ownership and why your timber in comparison to a final product is fairly worthless. But that's not to say that you don't have a huge advantage as a landowner. Unlike all the other players in the forest industry, you are the only player whose product is not, by definition, a commodity. You, unlike all the other players in the industry, have the ability to be a price maker instead of a price taker. And I know that's a very controversial statement, but let me explain what I mean. And first we have to discuss exactly what a commodity is. Speaking a bit simplistically, a commodity is any good that is completely interchangeable with other goods of the same type. For example, gold is a commodity because, assuming, you know, equal purities, an ounce of gold is interchangeable with another ounce of gold mined on the opposite side of the world. Coal is another commodity, oil is a commodity, and of course, lumber is a commodity. Now, very importantly, a commodity can have grades. So, for example, uh, oil is graded based on its uh, purity and sulfur content, etc. And so there are different benchmarks depending on the grade of oil. So in the US, for example, use WTI, West Texas Intermediate, and you know, in Iraq they have a different benchmark, Russia has a benchmark, and there are a lot of different benchmarks, Brent in Europe, uh, that kind of is supposed to be a proxy for a specific type and grade of oil. And importantly, in international markets, there's usually a definition of what exactly is the good being bought and sold. For example, with lumber, it's random length. Uh, for gold, it's a certain purity and a, a, has to be a bar of a certain size, etc. So there can be differences in the products, technically speaking, but they're more or less interchangeable. But importantly, their differences aren't large enough to be an inhibition to creating an international market for these goods. So in our highly financialized world, they have pretty much been able to commoditize everything. In fact, you can even buy and sell futures of frozen orange juice concentrate on the market. So now that I have that out of the way, let's look at the supply chain of forestry specifically. So we can break the value chain into three basic components. There is stumpage, which is the right to harvest timber on land. That's what you receive as a landowner. There's logs, which are the harvested trees processed into logs that are sold to the sawmill. And then the product the sawmill makes, which is lumber, which is of course the dimensional lumber used to build houses and other goods. So lumber, as we've said, is a well-known commodity traded on international markets. When a mill sells its lumber, it has very little, if any, control over the price. That's all determined completely externally on a globalized market. Now, if we look at the market for logs, it's a little bit different, but still essentially the same. Because there are so many species and grades and uses for logs, they're not really commoditized and sold on an open exchange. But that doesn't mean they aren't still sold as a commodity a mill is going to have a standardized pricing system for its logs. Now there might be negotiations between parties, but nonetheless, every log is essentially an interchangeable good, assuming the same grade. So for example, every double A grade of sugar maple logs of this many feet in length is going to be treated as essentially equal and the volume is gonna be paid the same. And yes, of course, there are specialty logs that are sold on auctions, but those are the exception and certainly not the rule. So like the sawmill, when a logger is selling his product, his logs, he has no control over the price. That is set by the mill, and the mill's prices are set by international markets. So for these two actors, loggers and mills, they cannot control the price of their product. All they can do to enhance profitability is uh, increase internal efficiencies, which often is uh, a dangerous game to play. <laughs> I really like the quote from Nassim Taleb that says, most modern efficiencies are just deferred punishment. Um, and that's actually why there tends to be a lot of failure in these businesses, is they do things that seem profitable at first and then years down the line, it uh, doesn't work out so well. And that's kind of the history of industrial forestry. <laughs> but anyway, now let's look at stumpage, which is the price a landowner pays. There is absolutely no international pricing 
for standing timber. It wouldn't be possible. And even for local loggers, they do not have standardized pricing. They would not be able to function profitably if they had a standardized list of pricing that they could post on their website or give to potential customers. That's because the values in a timberland vary so drastically and the efficiency of harvesting that varies just as drastically. Now here's why this is such an advantage. Because there's such a huge difference between low value and low efficiency timber and high value and high efficiency timber, you as the landowner have a functionally non-existent ceiling for the potential price of your product, which is your standing timber. If you're going to negotiate the sale of that timber, you have the upper hand in that negotiation. Now, clearly you can look at the situation and say, wait a second, if the mill's a price taker and the logger's a price taker, then thinking that the landowner's anything but another price taker is harboring some sort of delusion. And there is some validity to that until you take a look at the ability to increase the internal efficiencies of the other actors. And that's what really tips the balance. The sawmills can't really help their customers except to provide them a standardized product. The loggers can't really do anything to help the sawmills, you know, except for the cut logs to the correct specifications, which can be an issue sometimes. But they really can't do anything to help the sawmill except for sell them a standardized product. You can do a lot to help the logger and the sawmill become more efficient. And I talk a lot about this in a video I made that I think is a very important video to watch. It is uh, why it pays to let trees grow. And I talk about the benefits of having larger timber. Specifically, it is a lot easier and cheaper to harvest larger timber than smaller timber. So completely independent on the value of the product, if your timber is larger and it's at an appropriate density, it is going to be much more valuable for the logger and the sawmill than value locked in smaller, poor quality stems. So in the world of forestry, there's kind of a joke that's also a serious thing. Uh, and it's a joke between loggers, it's a joke between foresters, but it's not really a joke between foresters and loggers. And that's the problem. The joke is that the foresters are always telling the loggers that there's going to be better wood on the next block. Because, you know, the logger might be in a stand of very small timber, it's very inefficient, their costs are very high, and they're complaining about it. And the forester would just say, oh, well, you know, the next block that we're harvesting, that's big timber, it's great, like, don't worry about it, you're going to be making so much money on the next block that any losses you get on this block are immaterial. Um, but <laughs> more often than not, that land of milk and honey never really comes. But you can be that land of milk and honey. And if you are that just sweet block of big spruce or you know big walnut or whatever it happens to be depending on your market and your region, you are going to have the upper hand in any negotiation and you can command a higher price for your product. But we call that situation when you have an upper hand in negotiations being a price maker. Your land is not a commodity and you should stop treating it like it's a commodity. And this is a message for absolutely everybody who's involved in the forestry market. I have been to a lot of forestry conventions and trade shows and everything you can possibly imagine over the years and they tend to be formulaic and very predictable. Uh, it tends to be a lot of people speaking about potentials to open up new commodity markets. For example, uh, pulp markets are a very popular one that people talk about. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. Ultimately, things like pulp markets are incredibly important. They do help everyone in the supply chain. And I'm not saying that they don't. But too often, there's sort of an abdication of any sort of responsibility. Landowners act like they are completely without any sort of self-efficacy in this market, and they're just kind of at the whim of international markets. And that's really just not the case. So when these people come in and they talk about, you know, this new project that's opening up, you know, in town, or this new mill, this new science, this this new initiative to build more buildings out of wood or whatever it happens to be, you know, making ship fuel out of uh, hardwood pulp. Um, it's all this kind of abdication to an external force that you ultimately have no control over. And like I said, all those things are important. The more markets for wood, the better. 
The problem is that it distracts landowners and foresters from the truth that they already have a huge advantage, which is that they're not necessarily at the whim of these external markets. Now, for some very large landowners, it's not necessarily practical to micromanage their forest and make it uh, super efficient and, and uh, make every block they have the land of milk and honey for foresters. So what typically tends to happen and what has kind of defined the history of the forest economy is that larger landowners have decided to engage in what I call extra silvic economic activity. They've gone above and beyond being a landowner and they have vertically integrated their industries. They've purchased sawmills, uh, in some cases they've had their own logging crews, etc. So they kind of become a uh, cartel of sorts in the industry and they can set their own prices that way. That can work. It tends to be a lot more risky than the traditional land ownership model. And history proves that there's a lot more bankruptcies, a lot more, um, you know, sales of companies and mergers and so on when that sort of thing starts to happen. But it can work. It can even work for smaller landowners. And even myself, you could say that by owning a small piece of logging equipment, I am vertically integrating in a micro enterprisal way. And that would be accurate. But my fear is that people are missing the core point, which is that land ownership by its very nature can elude some of these international forces that can suppress prices. And when we forget that, we are forfeiting one of the greatest and most convex advantages of land ownership. And what I mean by that is the benefits are just amazingly profound. If you're growing the right products, if you're growing them to the proper size, and you are ensuring the efficiency of the harvest on your woodlands, the returns are just going to outsize what would be otherwise the case. And like I said, I encourage you to take a look at my video, uh, Why It Pays to Let Trees Grow, to understand this a little more. So the question is, how do you break out of the commodity sphere? How do you, as a landowner, become a price maker and become somewhat, at least, immune to macroeconomic forces? And the answer is, you have to manage your land. You have to understand silviculture, you have to understand forestry and land management, and you have to have a strategy for making your land irresistible to customers. You have to produce value for your customers the same way any other business would. Now, the best way to get started is to get my free ebook that I wrote. I have a free guide available for landowners. It's a great introduction to forestry and silviculture and land management and gives you a great context for beginning your journey to becoming your own forester and being able to break out of that commodity cycle so you can have the most productive asset you possibly can. So I'm gonna leave a link in the description and in the comments. I highly suggest you check that out. So until next time, later.